Now entering Nerdist.com. Streets were closed, and there was, and then they kept making us go across the bridge back. Uh-huh. And forth. Thank you. And then he started freaking out. And I was like, "What? What is happening?" I just, ju- I jumped out of the car like eight blocks ago and just ran here. I'm like, "You go, you go. I'm fine." No, my husband tried to drop me off here once after we'd already been working here for a while, and I was like, "No, we're on the bridge. We're on the bridge." And then just got out of the car and walked back across the bridge. Yeah, he was not. Uh, he was. I mean. Listen, I was not thrilled about it, but he was not handling the stress well. He did not. It was. It was not part of his. It was almost like I expected him to go. I was not ready for this, and then and then just bail out. <laughs> but thank you very much for making that happen. No, it's fine. It's totally fine. It's just one of those things. It's just. It's just a great lesson about life. Like you can prepare as much as you want. And in the end, you just can't control the world. Long Island City will always kill you. <laughs> so is this where you guys have been pretty much the entire production? Yeah, we've been here, uh, except for the in the first year in pre-production, we had an office in Midtown on 54th Street. That was, um, oh, that was, it was a tiny office, but it was nice to be um, in the city. And so we've been here, our first season we were... Um, Downstairs, we had these. These offices were the Sopranos offices. Oh wow! First, yeah, the first uh, year that we were here, and we had offices that faced the ramp to the bridge, and we looked at the post, the billboard for Norbit for most of the year. Right, which I enjoyed. The runaway hit of the year. Funny movie. Norbit. Did you see Norbit? I saw Norbit after having a glass of wine. Yeah. I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> I stand by that assumption. I love Eddie Murphy. I, 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 I've had many conversations on this podcast about the dissection of Eddie Murphy's career. Yeah. It's like he's such an amazing character actor. If he would just take small, weird roles. Yeah. But I guess but it's not that easy. Do whatever you want to do. I mean, I kind of like it. He's like, I want to do this now. Yeah. Tracy Morgan was saying that, well, I guess my question is, but he was saying that there was some idea that was floating out there that may, maybe Eddie was going to write a movie. No, I mean, she takes out, but that Eddie was supposedly talking about writing a movie for him and Tracy where they play um, uh, runaway slaves. Uh-huh. I, like, I want to see that movie, <laughs> but I don't want to hopefully that I'm not burning Tracy. No, and also, uh, just so if anyone listening that this doesn't make the cover of like some entertainment <laughs> blog, deadline.com. Tina Fey says that uh, Tracy Morgan and Eddie Murphy are writing a slave comedy. No, that's not, please. But we can wish. <laughs> they would. So, uh, how, how, first of all, this is huge that you're on this podcast for me. Oh, okay. And for our people who listen to the podcast, <laughs> uh, you, like, almost literally from episode one, you should get Tina Fey on. Like, that's a thing that I could just make happen. But here we are. I know. I don't know how this happened, but thank you very much. It's my pleasure. I, the first time, I mean, obviously I knew you from SNL, but the first time I actually saw you live was we both did the Aspen Comedy Festival mm-hmm. in 2001, I think. Um, that sounds right. Right? It was, and you were, it was Dratch and Faye, you guys were. It was 2000 or 2001, yeah, it might have been, yes, yeah, I can't remember, but it was, yes, we did Dratch and Faye, uh, Rachel Dratch and I did our two-woman show out there, and I had never, I've never been to the Aspen Comedy Festival before or since. But it was fun. Well, they it's it stopped. They don't have it now. Yeah, they don't have it anymore. It it was Aspen was this weird in the comedy community. It felt like oh, if you do Aspen, that means you've made it. Right. And then you go and you're like, I just performed for a bunch of drunk, rich, white people <laughs> in a ski lodge. Is this? Yeah. Where I guess the- there's the th- thought that agents and stuff would were there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I only went that one time. Was it fun? It was fun. The fun and the most fun thing I remember was Catherine O'Hara. Uh, hosted a, a a late night show that was I forget the name of it, but it was it was supposed to be dirty. You're supposed to bring your dirtiest material. Yeah. And Dratch and I uh, wrote a bit for that that we've done a bunch of times since, and we always wanted to do it on SNL, but it was so dirty that we could never. <laughs> it didn't translate. We couldn't clean it up enough that it was okay for broadcast. What was the sketch? It was we played these uh, characters called the Staley Sisters, and um. They were kind of a folk singer 
quite a Na- Nancy Griffith style Southern folk singers who, who were there to um, sing their their father songs. Their father had died in a, some kind of some kind of wreck, and then they were going to sing his songs. And his songs had titles like um, "Dirty Juanita" and um, <laughs> "Titties and Beer" was another one. Um, but they had these long um, kind of Nancy Griffith style um, like. I remember my grandmother and I would sit on the porch, like these long, long wind-ups to songs that were inevitably oh, right. filthy. You know? And, they, and Josh played the cello, and I butchered like three <laughs> chords on the guitar. That's those are fun. Like the, those are fun sketches to do. But then and then you try to do them for television, and then people, then the censors are like, "Can you change this?" Yeah. And you're like, "You can't. You can't. It, it literally has to be." Yeah. There was a, a Will Forte had a bit from the Groundlings that he did in his audition for Saturday Night Live that I think maybe they did eventually try to find a way to do on the air. Um, that was uh, he played a, a, a silver robot guy like that stands still in the park like at the for pier, money, in the, park, the pier, yeah. Area. yeah. And um, I forget there was some long long wind up to it, and then a song. I think it was a song, but the end of this the. Again, I'm being so filthy on this already, but the end of the song, the, the kind of blow of the song was Will Forte and his lovely voice singing, I suck cock from my face paint. <laughs> over and over and over and over. And uh, I, know, I don't know if they got it. They tried to find a way to get it on, on the air, but um, that's it. There's, there's can't literally get around no way to that. do it, no. No. You can't, it's not... Yeah, even if you made it like wieners, it just doesn't have this. Yeah, you just have I, to I, say... I wonder if we should look back and see if they... If they I know they took it to a dress rehearsal at least. I should ask Forte if it aired. I can't remember. Did you? Did you? I read. I, I'm. I'm halfway through Bossy Pants right now, which I got the audio version because I, I always like to hear writers read their own stuff. Sure. Because there's so much. I don't know. It's just nice to hear your intention. Uh huh. Um, but total side note, when I I wrote a book and when I did the audio version, I. I laughed every time I heard you say, so if you picked up this audio book, I remember all yes, those they, times I had to change book they to make audio you change book. book yeah. to audio book, yeah. Like, it doesn't really always make when sense. When I decided to write this audio book. <laughs> exactly. Huh? Can I just say it once and then you just could drop it in <laughs> or whatever? Like the Amtrak lady? They were like, audio book. Is that right? <laughs> you just had a whole other person. When I was the audio book, <laughs> it's like a weird German guy. Um, but uh, Werner Herzog says. Yeah, Werner Herzog says. <laughs> Werner Herzog reads audiobook in Tina Fey's Bossy Pants. <laughs> what? Yeah. But uh, I, I got to the part where uh, right now I'm so into all of the comparisons between the Harvard writing staff and the the Second City, sure. the, the Chicago mm-hmm. improvisers, mm-hmm. Uh, and the and the sort of you, you compared it to you know the logical Spock and then the emotional Kirk and yes. that's what makes the perfect yes. writing staff. Yes. Um, was that was you were you came in on the Chicago side? Yes. So were the Harvard guys? <laughs> is there a rivalry like going into it? Like ah, those goddamn Harvard kids. I mean, I think there was more at SNL. The 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 nice thing here uh, that Robert Carlock and I mention often is the palpable difference because the way SNL is designed, it is designed to be cutthroat. It is designed that you are to compete with everyone, including your friends, every single week down to the last minute of the show when the last, you know, either or between two sketches, one gets cut and one doesn't. And the nice thing about the last six years here at 30 Rock is that we are all working toward a common goal in a way that if you get one joke in on someone else's episode, great. If you, it, it, there's just, it's a completely different um, setup just because it's a half hour versus that. Sure. At SNL, you know, everyone writes on Tuesday, then you come in Wednesday and um, see what plays at the table, and that gets narrowed down to 15 things, down to 12 things, down to eight things, and it's just, uh, and so I think, you know, I think there was more separation um, between, uh, there were sort of three camps at SNL. There's Harvard people, uh, Second City Groundlings types, and then the, probably the most isolated, the stand-ups. Sure. Because they're used to being isolated. And, right. And know. we don't always play well with others. Right. You know, <laughs> I mean, you come talk about coming from an even like, worse, more combative environment. To, if you toured America, sleeping in a disgusting condo. 
<laughs> fighting with some audience in the Midwest. And... Yeah, yeah, because they want chicken wings. Yeah. And you're trying to point out yeah. uh, some thoughts you have about the current thoughts administration. I have. <laughs> right. Or or why don't they understand things that are funny about Lord of the Rings? They don't uh, rednecks <laughs> right. don't really seem to care about yeah. that. Is that so hard if you're doing stand up? Do you wanna you wanna do you wanna make your act this expression of yourself, but at the same time do you feel like you have to make do you have to sort of back up hunks for when you're in different kinds of venues or you just do your thing? No, I I, I do a lot of crowd work because mm-hmm. it's the, I, it just sort of personalizes the material for me mm-hmm. and it keeps the show different every time. Mm-hmm. And I do have bits that I go back to. But, I, I mean, without completely changing who I am, I do adjust a little bit yeah. for the crowd because it's a relationship. And mm-hmm. why should they? I don't, I'm not of the belief of, like, you, this is what I think, and fuck you if you don't right. buy into it. But it's I also, all, if you hate it, it's even more awesome. Yeah, exactly. But <laughs> you I'm not, leave. I'm not punk rock that way. But I also feel like, but as an audience, you got to give a little bit. Like right. it can't be all my job. There's got to be a relationship. Yeah. So I do a little. I think Patton Oswalt said, you know, ah, I write one joke for them, one joke for me. No, that's and good. so there's this sort of like balance back uh-huh. and forth. And then if you do your, when you do your HBO special, you take all those jokes for them out. <laughs> I did. Well, I did. I shot my special in February oh. and I, and I was like, fuck it. I'm just, I'm just doing all the stuff I want to do. Uh-huh. And, you know, it's sort of like what you said with the Harvard guys of they don't have the flop sweat of seeing people react to it once they put it in the lampoon. Yes. It is a different thing. You get out there in front of a crowd, you will find yourself going for things and doing different things to keep that relationship going. Yeah. But I imagine that when you were when you were in the touring company in the Second City Touring Company, that had to be pretty. I mean, as grueling as it sounds, you know, to drive all over the Midwest in a van and and have to just do comedy in weird places. But it was a dream come true, right? It I mean, was that's the best. $75. That's guerrilla training. Yes, and you know, in a way, so much safer than stand up because we were always together. And if you started to bomb, you know, you could just turn to the person next to you. Whereas I feel like I've, I really admire stand-ups. The, I, I've, the couple times I've done it on the most amateur level, it's so terrifying, and it's it's the the highs are higher and the lows are lower. If you if a joke bombs, it's you. That's all you. And if you get that <laughs> laugh, you're like, hey, that was all me too. Right. But um, it's much safer going out in a group of six. Because you're all you're all in it together, mm-hmm. and then you can all as a group go. Well, this crowd didn't huh, we really. We are awesome, right? They don't get it. They it is a good support structure, but I still find <laughs> I still find improv more terrifying to me than stand up because I always feel like with stand up you can still you can still engage the crowd in a certain way mm-hmm. where you can just kind of grab them by the scruff if you need to, but mm-hmm. uh, but with improv and sketch you're just. You're in your thing, and it's harder to break right. the fourth wall. Well, with improv, if you're really doing long form improv, you really can kind of adjust at any time. You know, I've seen when I used to improvise, I'd do Ask Cat with the the UCB. You know, if you watch Ian Roberts or 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 Matt Besser, if they or well, any of them actually, if they just want if something was just not going well, and they just just stop it and address it and just do a complete 180. You know, they had the freedom to just change whatever they wanted at any time. I do like guys like you know guys like Besser or Will Ferrell or pe- mm-hmm. people that just seem like you know they if something doesn't go well they don't really give a shit mm-hmm. like they just part of what makes them so great is that they just go on to the next thing and yeah. there's no Besser I think maybe has a special delight in um, <laughs> <laughs> in people's discomfort you know Amy used to talk about that when they had their show and they would do prank things and she was like oh, I don't like the, I don't like doing pranks on people but part of this job I guess but because some people I think are built more they they kind of enjoy creating those awkward moments are you do you think you're someone who in in situations just like oh I just want everyone to be happy I just want everyone to feel good I just want everyone to you know even even in performance situations um kind of in that like I don't I don't like yeah I don't like prank things either we did a thing at Second City one time I'm trying to remember if I, I think I was just watching this. Scott Adsit did this bit, um, I think it was, yeah, I think it was in a set after the show Pinata Full of Bees. I don't think I was, I think I watched it from the outside. I wasn't in the show yet. And they did this bit where um, they came out and he tried as realistically as possible to tell the crowd to stop the set and tell the crowd that the president had been shot. Oh, and um, it was this you know, experiment that I don't even remember. Oh, I guess who was, was president then? Could have been... Probably Fillmore? 
It was probably Miller Fillmore. Yeah, I think it might be Fillmore. And um, said he had been bayoneted. He <laughs> had uh, been shot by an engine. <laughs> and, uh, and that they were going to just take a minute and just pull a TV out and watch the, uh, the news so we could everyone just like could be together and see. You know, he tried to do this as convincingly as possible. And, um, and they brought, they rolled the TV out in a cart and then he turned the TV on. And the, and the bit was that before he switched to the news, whatever channel had the news, there was another channel that came on, had some funny sports bloopers. Then he kind of gets caught up in the funny sports bloopers and forgets to turn the channel to the thing. And then the audience is kind of realizing, oh, just so I think it was an experiment for them to see how much could they fool an audience and when would the audience realize it was a bit. And then when they did realize, would they just be mad? And I hated the whole thing. Yeah. I thought it was just awful. <laughs> Where you want to just stop and like, go, just, it's a bit, you just guys. Just stop a bit, everyone. Totally. Just don't do that. It's totally fine. <laughs> how much do you trust the... Uh, the audience in your head. Oh, with stuff now that we're shooting on film? Yeah, where, I mean, like, because I feel like sometimes things that destroy me in my own head, I'm right. like, that eh, doesn't really, that didn't work out so well. Like, what, I imagine with SNL, you probably were able to close that gap. Well, you have the real audience. You have the first audience you have is the table read, and so they're going to laugh a little bit differently because they're in some ways more jaded and in other ways more forgiving because they like certain comedy kind of push button things um, and then you have the dress rehearsal then you have the crew actually in between you have the crew you can kind of feel if the crew thinks this is happening or not uh, and then you have um, dress rehearsal mm -hmm. which is the most telling so that with that process is good here all we have here are we do have table reads um, which are informative although at this point too I think we're all a bunch of um, we've all drunk the Kool-Aid at this point sure. so it's um Everything plays great. <laughs> plays great. <laughs> is that good or is that is that is that almost detrimental sometimes if you don't the, have? The good the... thing is I don't think we have any fake laughers on staff, mm -hmm. but I do think everyone's just really happy to be here. But because um, that that's bad uh, when you have like uh, people who laugh harder like at their own bits or stuff. Sure, that's that's reprehensible. <laughs> You're not supposed to laugh. Either. Mm. <laughs> not supposed to, you're not supposed to like. I'll just do this to get the crowd going. Like, <laughs> I was like, no, don't do that. No, that's not. Mm -mm. That's what honest warm-up people do. That and that is a noble profession. But when you see writers on the floor, you know, like half-hour things, kind of la laughing, laughing yeah. too hard. <laughs> and look, yeah. If someone's laughing and then looking around at the same time, that's no, that, that's, that's a red flag. That is a that is a huge red flag. Mm -hmm. We well, just never. I mean, I, I the, the, the whole. It, it, first of all, it's amazing to me that. Uh, I always say it's amazing to me that anything good ever gets through because there are so many, mm -hmm. I mean, so many hurdles to get through, particularly with network television. Did, mm -hmm. are they pretty much, I, I, when 30 Rock came along, I was like, well, how did this get, how did this get made? How did this not get ruined? <laughs> I don't know. Um, we, we, I think a couple things worked in our favor. Um, uh, one, we are here and the, everyone who could weigh in was on the phone you know and where it wasn't here all the time but sure. um and i think the fact that lauren michaels was our uh one of our executive producers i feel like that the network certainly had more trust in us than if it was just me trying my first thing and robert had some pedigree robert had been at friends and and a joey but um i i think and also for yeah for whatever reason they they haven't they the our executives that we've worked with on the show have always been uh, quite quite lenient. They've they don't really come at us some content. I remember we had some notes the first season about like you know because Liz, Liz should be good at her job that kind of stuff. Um, uh, it's interesting uh, it, and it's it's helpful because it, it mostly is the network notes usually are about story. Uh, I've never had a network note about the execution of a joke, really, or the choice of a uh, choice of joke. It's always about story and and character development. That's which is good because you need to someone to make you keep doing that. So it's another example of when you let funny people do the job you hired them for. Hopefully, yes. <laughs> it, it tends now, to work out okay. Now, has it paid off for them? No. <laughs> Why do you say that? Well, I mean, we're never we've never been a wide commercial hit for them I'm, you know we've we've in the, what in the best years averaged six or seven million people and then now down to like three or four million although in our defense when you add um 
the DVR numbers, which continue to be slightly mysterious. I don't know why. It's weird. And then they also, yeah, I would have meetings with executives where they go, well, these are the numbers of the show. Here's the DVR numbers. And you go, wow. And they go, but we can't count those. You're yeah, like, but let's start counting them. Like, what, who cares? <laughs> they say, well, the advertisers don't like that you can just skip commercials, so they don't oh, count those. Sure. You're like, yeah, but because I think there's, I think there's this weird, mysterious metric that needs to exist that encapsulates not just how many people watch a show on Thursday night, mm-hmm. but the cultural impact that it has. And I, and I think you know, Thirty Rock is one of those shows like Mad Men that just, you know, yeah, twenty million people don't maybe not watch it, but it's. It's so much more culturally relevant than, you know, than uh, a, a stupid reality show. Mm-hmm. I mean, I see it's it, just because I noticed I noticed comedy is watching Thirty Rock and then watching Thirty Rock isms trickle into society or trickle into people's oh, delivery cool. or or sayings like "what the what" like uh-huh. it just be, they just become part of our vernacular. Right. And I feel like that is more valuable as a brand of a mm-hmm. show than, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, country music television gets this. Yeah, but this is something that we're all yeah, talking about. But it is it, 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 it's, it is a weird um, thing where they do have to be able to to monetize it. For, and, they, and then they must have found some way because we would. It's not a charity. We wouldn't still be here. Right. Um, so I think you know. I think what they used to tell us like, well, you sell high end advertising. You know, so the five people that watch all bought Lex. <laughs> right. I, Alex. I don't know. But um but yeah, it's uh, but thank you for saying that about the show. That's nice. Well, this week is sponsored by Millionaire Dirigibles. <laughs> like if we could just sell two dirigibles, we're good, we're we're good, good for, for the, the month, yeah, then we're fine. <laughs> Was it hard to cuz uh change is scary, but so you were on this uh you're on SNL for a long time and mm-hmm. you're incredibly successful on the show and then you're going to leave and it's scary. So how did you kind of make the decision like this is going to be okay rather than cling to the thing that was comfortable? Well, sure. I, I was just we've been talking about this a lot recently because we're kind of back here again. But it, it's hard um, in, in life when you have to uh, ch- choose these transitions on your own. It's always hard when you go to school and you graduate or you get kicked out. But you, it's not up to you when you're going to um, transition. Mm-hmm. And it is hard to take responsibility for your own transitioning. But um, what I'm trying to say is I'm becoming a serial killer. <laughs> oh, my God. Really? <laughs> I am becoming Mothman. No, um, the, <laughs> um, uh, but uh, and that's no the same thing. You, you start to look around, and you're like, I've been here a while. I feel like a senior. I don't want to feel like a double, triple senior. Right. Um, and you just realize that the time has come. And um, also for me, I had uh, uh, my older daughter at that time. And that's an immediate perspective of like... My baby is at home, and I'm listening to someone else's, like, first try at this kind of talk show sketch that I've seen a bunch of times, and I'd like to be home. Mm-hmm. I'd like to go home. It really happens. The change happens when you have a baby. It did for me. Um, and then, of course, I've ended up being, not being home very successfully for long. But, um, and you, uh, you know, I've actually talked to friends of mine at, at other shows about this, which is that you also go through the thing of, like, oh... Our kind of moment in time culturally has passed in a way because I think we've actually been pretty lucky because culture, pop culture, can move incredibly fast. Sure. I mean, do you, do you remember the arc of the way people felt about Ugly Betty? Oh yeah, I was, absolutely. I was like, Ugly Betty is this? Why is everybody? What's happening? Is the same? <laughs> is still nice? Is still nice? What's happening? Like everyone just like, no, no, we love it. We are done. Like, what's happening? <laughs> Um, <laughs> that seemed like that show would go on forever. Yeah. I was like terrifying to us when they, because they shot near us and out here and they got canceled. I'm like, if they got canceled, oh, brother. But anyway, so you have this feeling of like, okay, the arc of our time, like we're kind of grandmotherly now in our time and and yet you're still working just as hard and you still feel like you're you're putting absolutely as much effort into these episodes and and but you feel like you're just kind of, like people have moved on and that it's a weird position to be in do you still feel um do you still feel the rewards emotionally or are you just like ah, i just have to get through work or do no you- no i definitely still feel like if we get uh, any if we get a you know feel like the episode was good or like you were saying if there's anything that f- feels like it was uh sticky culturally i always like that if something you know 
uh, seems to stick somewhere. If people mm-hmm. say that they're normaling or any, you know, pulling anything from the shot, I like that. Um, uh, so no, it's, it remains a, a, a labor of love. But it is, it is like a weird feeling to be like, what? So we're doing the same thing, but now you hate it? Okay. <laughs> what happened? Great. We'll just keep doing the same thing and it'll come back around. Damn the tides. <laughs> I, uh, I just hope that, you know, because like for me, this is, I mean, having you on the podcast is just, just such a great thing. Right? It's, it's one of my favorite yeah. things. And, and, and the fact that I still get really excited about stuff like this. I mm-hmm. hope there never comes a point where it's like, yeah, I got to do this. You know, like things when you're a kid and you go, oh, if I could just do this, I'll always be happy. And yeah. then you start to achieve some of that and you're like, this is kind of a pain in the ass. Like, I, I still hope that this stuff that I get excited about, I still am able to retain that joy. For sure. I mean, I see, yeah, I think you know, I get to come in on a day and, you know, do scenes with Alec Baldwin or do dress Jack McBrayer up in some idiot costume that, that that's never going to not be a joyful experience. Yeah. Um, I want to thank you for referencing Sleepaway Camp in your book. You're very welcome. That was, um, <laughs> I think I, when I heard you say that, I, I think I did the, I did the audience thing of like, hey, like I literally <laughs> was like, oh my God, the girl with the penis. That's awesome. That, that, that image, I can see it right now. <laughs> it looked like a weird, rah, like there was some, it was a strange, mm-hmm. the effects weren't quite. Mm-mm. How did they do it? Um, At that time, who knows? I think they had a head of the, the girl, mm-hmm. and then they somehow superimposed. But is a is it? It seemed to almost be an adult sized penis. Could be, yeah. In my horrified memory, yeah. It, I remember a, 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 some a, bushiness to it. Yeah, I think that was. You know, maybe what it was. It might have just been a prosthetic that was kind of masked with a lot of fur. Maybe she grew a dick. Maybe. Just, Maybe we should all just watch that movie real quick. <laughs> just freeze frame. Make it our desktop. <laughs> just watch it at work. <laughs> you talked about um, when you uh, when you were working at the Y and then went started taking improv classes. But what was it that made you kind of tip and go, "Oh, I'm, I I think I might be funny or I might want to do this." Well, I went to Chicago wanting to do that. Oh, okay. Uh, so that was my fantasy was to go there and try to get in um, to the second city Um, how I knew about the second city I'm not quite sure except that I had some books about the history of Saturday Night Live and so I knew that Gilda Radner and Bill Murray and people had come they had come that way Um, so yeah I knew that I wanted to try to get in there Um, and I did find that the Chicago improv community is just all encompassing and and wonderful uh, just a wonderful lifestyle for someone in their in their early t- 20s to 32 and then get out, get <laughs> and out after that you're just hanging around after that you probably have an alcohol problem <laughs> hey you guys let's go to another bar <laughs> uh, i don't know yeah but we would just go anywhere just if there was any place um where you could i imagine you know starting stand-up is similar where if you see there's an open mic night or something but there's a, the improv version of an open mic night where you could get up and play a game or you could do anything or go watch anyone we would just go to all of it and i say we but at first it was just i would go and then i would you'd meet make one friend in class and then you would cling to that friend and i'm still i'm still friends with people that i met in those first improv classes my my buddy kevin Riom, he's teaching at second city now he's like a dad of two and I still talk to him all the time. Would you have been happy doing if, if your career had been like, oh, I, you know, I'll, I'm teaching improv, but I got a family, and that's yeah. That's if fun. I had a nice little apartment in Andersonville, and I was, you know, like a head of PR at the Second City, sure. <laughs> head of I was PR. in charge of posters at Second City, sure. Because <laughs> there's definitely a thing that the thing that you have in terms of. Uh, I'm busy, but I don't know how you manage to. It's like. Y- Wow, 30 Rock, but then she just wrote a movie, and then there's a book, and then she's back, but she has kids. Like, yeah. I, I don't, I think, you know, one of the biggest questions I'm sure you get asked a lot is how, how do you manage all of that? Yeah. Well, here, I'm very, very dependent on Robert Carlock here at this point, um, because uh, I'm, I'm shooting so many hours a day that once it, we're all here for pre production, and then once production starts, Robert is running this room entirely. And then I'm, you know, 
reading every draft of every script and giving notes, but the actual sitting down page by page execution of it is going on in here with Robert and the rest of the staff. Um, the book uh, is very short. I don't know if you noticed that. <laughs> and it still almost killed me. But um, I know so I felt like I was like, oh, thank God that book came out okay. Because during it, I was like, oh, this is really going to. I kept telling my husband, like, this is going to ruin me. <laughs> ruin me, I tell you. <laughs> Just losing my mind over this little tiny slight book. Bossy pants released, <laughs> Faye's career over. Like, the same news, the same front the page. The same day. There's a, there was an extra, extra about it. <laughs> They brought back newsboys just to make <laughs> sure so people so. <laughs> found out. Uh, do you? Did you? Were you writing it? Were you writing in bed, like on a laptop? I was writing or? on set. I was writing on turnarounds. I was writing in the makeup chair. Um, I was writing over Christmas vacation. A lot of it, which was, uh, I was you know mad about, but um, <laughs> but yeah, somehow it got done. Somehow. Can you slow down, or do you do you not I, have the um, ability? I would now. I would. Uh, I, I would have trouble. I need to, I don't really remember how. Like SNL, we used to work really hard on those show weeks, and then on the weeks off, we did not work at all. We didn't have, on our shooting hiatuses, we didn't come in and, like, we probably should have, but it just how it runs over there. Um, and, and, we, and I didn't even have kids at the time, so I would just, like, hang around. I don't, I don't think I, I don't, yeah, I don't remember how to do that. I think, uh, oh, I don't remember who, I was talking to someone from, from SNL and they said, oh, I wish I had taken better advantage of the breaks. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, but they just. And you always have the best intentions. You are always saying, like, I'm going to write four sketches during the break <laughs> and then, boom, when Charlize gets here, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> it never happens. You're like, I'm just going to write ten sketches for The Rock. No. Did it get easier for you the longer you were on the show of, of being able to kind of was there any sort of ego wrangling with some of the guest hosts, or do they come in pretty humble? The hosts come in very, very humble usually and very vulnerable because it's a very vulnerable position to be in. I, now that I've done it, I, I've behaved in all the exact same ways that I had seen people do, which was like quiet in the pitch meeting, and then around somewhere into Thursday night, I was you know like, "Well, we don't have a monologue. We're freaking out about the monologue." Um, and uh, so yeah, no, by ninety nine point nine percent of the time, they they they're just so uh, excited to be there and so um, eager to for to have anyone guide them and how they could do it or yeah I think if you you don't you don't say yes to that hosting job if you're if you're not up for trying something insane yeah did you did the sort of uh, everything is on the verge of being on fire at any minute did that calm you down for the rest of your life you're like you know if I can handle this emotional pressure I'm probably okay in any it's, situation um, it is at least in terms of other production things like Robert and I will laugh uh, no it doesn't happen so much here but I'm trying to think where I've been at other jobs where they say oh well we can't we can't get that ready by today's Wednesday we can't get that ready by next Friday and you're like yeah I think you can because you just <laughs> see so all the, every designer and and painter and every tech person at SNL they make wigs like they they are so unbelievable, and they make things literally overnight. You could, you know, Lauren could call people in on a Friday night at 2 o'clock in the morning and pitch a cold open idea, and you'll have what you need for it by 2 o'clock the next day in the afternoon. So it does, it, it, keep, it calms you in that you remember that if and almost anything is possible. Don't panic. Don't rush into a, a decision about stuff. Um, uh, yeah, I kind of like that, um, that fire in the hole kind of like okay what are we gonna <laughs> so the person they're not here okay are they coming they're not coming great and so <laughs> I kind of like that uh, that's sort of a Liz thing right fly. that's sort of a Liz Lemon thing where just everything's always about to blow up and then yeah, like she, okay great she clearly makes that chaos for herself yeah. <laughs> she needs to admit that do you think that's something that do you have that sort of performer thing uh, no, I don't, I, I don't, uh, I don't, well, I think just for myself, I, I don't mind, I don't mind the, um, like people, we just did that, this live show and people are like, were you nervous? And I was like, no, I did mess up, but not because I was, uh, I, I find it kind of fun to try to figure out the puzzle of how to get it done in time and how to get from place to place. I, I kind of like it. Yeah, the live show, uh, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, on the live shows, that's, that's a... It's a fucking ballsy thing to do to to take a tape show. Oh, let's just fucking let's try that. I remember watching the live ER 
years ago. I remember when that. Oh yeah. They're like, oh, this is horribly great. Why did they do that? I don't know, are... but I loved it that they did it. And I hope our live show made people feel just as weird. Does it? it I mean, it, it sort of. I think it, maybe that what you're talking about maybe goes back a little bit to the. I, I love your idea of um, perfect is boring. Mm-hmm. That the idea that something because I think when most people set out to do something creative, they have this idea that it's either zero or a hundred percent. But it actually is enhanced by the like. There's a. Do you think there's a gift of bombing? I think well, for sure there is when you're when you're coming up in any way that that that. You know, I talk about this in the book a little bit, but the the gift of bombing at Second City was you just kind of learn that it doesn't hurt that much, and they, you, it makes you less fearful. Mm-hmm. You know, you can't be too afraid of ruining your permanent record. Write something that's terrible, try it. You know, do yeah. It, it there's a a freedom in bombing, and you know, I think. Do you agree that some sta- there are certain stand-ups uh, and comedians who you kind of see them uh, come alive like a little bit when they start. It's better to bomb hard than like just kind of be in a no man's land. I, I, the, what I, the example I think of is um, kind of the look that was in Colbert's eyes when he did that White House correspondence. <laughs> and he was like, I think he was kind of loving it. I think you would have to love it to do what he did because there's yeah. no. You go. You went in there swinging. That is not. That is not like. Making a handful of people at the UCB uncomfortable, like that's no, the that's president, <laughs> president of, of the United yeah. States, mm-hmm. uh, best nation in the world, <laughs> right? And uh, and then all of the press. Mm-hmm. I mean, it basically, he pranked the world, mm-hmm. which you know, I mean, it worked. I mean, I still talk about it, but I it never it, could have done it that. It worked to us, but it it didn't work in that room, but it worked. On this other level. Yeah. Well, it was a sort of, I think it was that, I mean, I hate to use him as a comparison because it's a hacky comparison, but it's just sort of the Andy Coffin thing of like, it's, this bit is bigger than this room. Mm-hmm. This bit is, these people are part of the bit. Right. Against their will. <laughs> but then everyone else outside this right. little bubble will love it. Mm-hmm. I couldn't, I could never, ever, ever do that, that kind of comedy, even with someone that I didn't like. I just hate making people uncomfortable. Yeah, I think uh, that's the, that. Like I said, that's the Besser, the Besser gene. You need the Matt Besser gene. Do you, the first part of the book is all about growing up for you, and 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 there is a lot of you know self deprecation and you mm-hmm. know sort of making fun of yourself or how you looked when you were younger mm-hmm. or whatever. And so, do you feel as comedians like the when you get older, part of what's fun is sort of is addressing all that stuff to sort of take ownership of it and claim it and make fun of it? Well, I think for me it's always about just, yeah, I'll take ownership of it first. Um, but it is, it's it's uh, it's interesting because uh, as a female comedy performer, I do feel like, oh yeah, this is going to become a problem. Though. Like, this is going to cut my, t- <laughs> this is going to cut my time short uh, when I hit like a weird middle ground where I can't play like a single gal going on dates. I'm going to have to find some kind of transitional role before I come back as a rapping grandma. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that that's what, I think that's kind of what you, the power that you have though as a writer creator is that, you know, it, it really, it really doesn't, you could, because you're funny, you can make anything you want. For sure it is. And hopefully you just have to be ready that your venue might change. Your venue might change from network television to back to the UCB theater. I think if you want to be doing stuff and creating stuff and, and make, doing your own pieces, you'll do it. But will your will uh, an outside industry force <laughs> change where you do it? <laughs> but I think now, which is sort of the way that entertainment is going, mm-hmm. where, where creators have a little bit more control in the sort yeah. of digital revolution, and that yeah. it's always going to be, well, the funny, there is a certain meritocracy to it, I think. Yes. Um, more so than some executive going, I want to see someone who looks good in these yellow pants. Exactly, for sure. You can make you can make your thing and get it seen um, much more easily. I, I, I just, I mean, I, I hope that you're aware, and maybe this is weird for you, but... Um, but I, the, the the consensus is that you're super hot. Like I got so Thank many. You. I asked the, uh, I, and I was even thinking about that when you were you were talking when you were talking in the in the book about, you know, when you were young. And I'm like, I wonder if she ever would have seen herself like on the cover of Vogue or, or you know or any of the, of the magazines mm-hmm. looking like super super hot and glamorous. No, 
And, if I, and I should, for people who are just listening to this, you should know that because once I heard this was only audio, I'm wearing no makeup. I have red dry patches on my cheeks. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, now I have dry our... patches on my cheeks. Mine are worse than yours. <laughs> no. You know, I can't even see yours. And uh, I, because our season is wrapped, we're not filming Thirty Rock anymore. My hair is uh, kind of like a fright wig. No. It's just it's, going it's not a fright I don't wig. Do, I don't do anything uh, to prevent any of this when we're not. I mean, I actually I thought I was like, oh, I should put on some like polite kind of street makeup, but then I didn't. I think you look great. I, I, I don't think. And by the way, your 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 fright wig, I think it's like, it's just like it's sexy and it's just brazen. peachy. It's no, just it's not. It's a, the, my consensus is that I'm slowly transitioning to looking more and more like a vampire. <laughs> I have this kind of um, <laughs> Nosferatu quality. This that's how it's presenting as how my features are aging. And you know what? It's not great, but that's how it's going. Have you ever heard? Of, when did Tina say she was born? I think she said the 1700s. 1430. As I was born to <laughs> darkness, as I call it. She's eternal, like Kenneth Parcell. <laughs> I also love what you said about how, because um, I think a lot of people try to write the opposite of this way. Uh, you said content dictates style. Mm -hmm. Just in terms of, you know, when you're when you're writing a sketch or whatever. That. You did. You said content dictates style. All right, good. Um, do you... Have, do you remember saying that? I don't, but I think it seems to make sense. <laughs> All right, we'll skip that. I have a bunch of questions from Twitter that people want okay. to ask you. Um, at Nerdy Ginge. Mm -hmm. Ginge? Ginge? Uh, like redhead? Maybe, but she didn't say, yeah. Maybe she just left off an R. Uh, I would ask if Tina prefers broccoli or asparagus, and I hope oh, she says broccoli. I say broccoli. I don't like asparagus. I love broccoli. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Just like steamed by itself? If need be, but uh, yeah, steamed, a little butter. All right. Oh. Jennifer Keegan, hardest part of raising two children. Sorry, I'm a mom type of question I'd ask another mom. Um, does the, uh, they wake up in the night. The, the sleep situation is the hardest thing because uh, we have a uh, six year old, six and a half year old, and um, uh, almost nine month old. And with the second one, going back to that thing of somebody waking up all the time in the night is super hard. And then the, uh, the older lady started waking up too. It was just was like, are we up? Is this, we're just gonna party now? They kind of. <laughs> no, we're not up. It's 3.30 in the morning. You should, I mean, listen, I, I say put in like a disco thing. And so when the kids get up, you can just lower the ball. Like, dan -dan 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 you, party, you guys party in here. <laughs> My, my best friend has two kids now, and one of them is only like like five months old, and mm -hmm. they basically activate each other. Yeah. Like one wakes up and is like, oh, now they, oh, great. Yeah. Okay, good. Yep. Good. So it's a baby pong. <laughs> um, at Dire Flail wants to know, oh, this must be a Douglas Adams reference. If you had a second head, what language would it speak? Ooh. I don't remember my Douglas Adams books well enough to. Zaphod Beeblebrox. Yeah. That's the guy, though, right? That's not the language. Yeah, that's a guy. Yeah, yeah, that's a guy with a couple heads. If I had a second head, what language would it speak? Um, <laughs> no, I'm just trying to genuinely answer it. <laughs> it is. What it, would be useful? Listen, this one's going to melt your noggin. So we ask the tough questions on yeah. this show. I mean, what is that? Was that a Hitchhiker's Guide? It's a Hitchhiker's Guide. You know, his, uh, the, yeah, I'll tell you what. That speaks another language? I, here's what I think about that question. Hmm. I think that question was designed more to say, hey, I like you, Hitchhiker's Guide. Right. And I'm trying to connect with you on right. the Douglas I Adams did, level, rather than actually getting a serious sure, answer. Sure, I did love those books when I read them, but I was probably 18 or 19 when I read them. And I, sure. And I liked the movie a lot, too. Yeah, the movie was fun. Oh, Martin Freeman was a good choice for the movie. Love the Sam Rockwell. Um, at Poet Soup, the center of the Milky Way tastes like raspberries and rum. Uh, what does the center of Tina Fey taste like? It seems obscene in it a way. It really is a little obscene. But <laughs> but that said, I feel we should try to answer it. Um, mm, like corn chips. Corn chips, good. <laughs> uh, at Stacy Laurel wants to know, what is your favorite ride at Disney World? And, and then I'm supposed to, <gasps> yes. I, I guess I'm supposed to bully you with this question. And convince her it's the world famous Jungle Cruise, because we love her. Well... I do love the Jungle Cruise. Are you a Jungle Cruise operator, perhaps? So that you, you have your, your jokes down. But weirdly, again, much like the broccoli asparagus thing, I do have a strong opinion about this. My favorite ride uh, in Disney World, Orlando, is the ride Soarin'. Soarin' over California? Yes, but in Florida, they just call it Soarin'. Oh, And I was weird. on it a lot of times before I figured out that it was... They just 
you just think like it's all of America. It's, no, it's just California. <laughs> it is. It is California, but they mm-hmm. just drop the California. You don't know. Yeah, you think it's like a beautiful because California has such diverse landscapes. Amer- America has a lot of wine country. It turns out. <laughs> like a lot of aircraft carriers and wine country. It is kind of fun, but some people freak out at soaring over California because you're in the harness, and then some people do not like the feeling of their legs dangling while yeah. their upper body is trapped. Yep, I like it. While they're blowing lilac odor into your face. Orange, fake orange smell. I love it. Um, good. Uh, at Faust M- MN asks, how much can you bench? Um, like a like a chest press? Yeah, let's say just like a chest press. Maybe 60 pounds. 60 pounds, good. <laughs> uh, at Wow Wee Wow wants to know, you who are Nestle Quick. Uh, Nestle Quick. Sprinkled over vanilla ice cream. Oh, shit. Yeah, try it. Hashtag mind blown. <laughs> At uh, Ababoa3 says, Would you rather be in a relationship with a ninja or a pirate? I think a pirate. Yep. But uh, just for because of I'm racist. Oh. <laughs> You're ninja racist? <laughs> well, the other problem is they're both gone a lot. They're both gone a lot. I mean, one, you kind of get to go to the beach. Yeah, my instinct is pirate. I mean, I think the ninja is just emotionally unavailable. Like, right, and I they're get... covered, they're kind of closed off. <laughs> You're disappearing into the relationship. Although with the pirate, you're always kind of second to the bird. Right? Mm. But the peg leg. Yeah. Um, does, uh, this is a weird question, at Klaus Future wants to know, do you see Liz Lemon as important in that she knows it's okay to be Homer Simpson and female sometimes? <laughs> <laughs> um, <That's> a, <laughs> I think the important is the act, only adjective that makes sense about her being like Homer Simpson. Um, uh, it's funny because I, I, over the years of seen kind of internet things people talking about how kind of they don't like that Liz Lemon seems to kind of hate sex and that she's just but for me it was so clear that I wanted to write her that way because I didn't want to film those scenes I just didn't I wanted to I wanted to be able to have a show where I didn't have to be cute I didn't have to like sit on top of anyone in a bra like there <laughs> was that was important to me as a writer performer and so her as a character, her kind of attitude about sex came from that, which I also thought was, you know, I liked it because it was not one I had seen before that she was, there was a joke that I want to say is Kay Cannon's joke from season one um, where Jenna's, uh, Sam back together with Jenna Duffy and she says, how, Jenna in a very Jenna way says, you know, how's the sex? And Liz Lemon says, fast and only on Saturdays. It's perfect. <laughs> I thought that was a, a new way of talking about things like that on TV. So, Yes, I think it's incredibly important that Liz Lemon is like a female Homer Simpson. I just think that, you know, like in the uh, up until the 70s, that there was basically very little humanity in television characters mm-hmm. at all. And then Norman Lear came along and mm-hmm. it was like, oh, and then Saturday Night Live, and like, mm-hmm. oh, okay, there are there are human qualities of right. characters in television. And then that all went away again in the 80s and most of the 90s. And then I feel like now... It was a lot of insult comedy. It was a lot of insult comedy or a lot of, I don't know... What do they call it? Like aspirational uh-huh. shows that yeah. are that aren't that aren't that real, but sort of sure. you know this is what you could aspire to. Be. And then now I feel like we're in a we're back in a nice place, and and this is thanks largely you <laughs> as well of of where, where characters are genuinely kind of you know like they might be quirky, but they're certainly human. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I hope so. That's, I think that's more interesting. That I mean, then again, there are shows that I love that I, I regard completely as um, uh, kind of fantasy. Uh, shows shows like Sex in the City where I I don't identify with any one of anything those women were doing except maybe Miranda because she did go to work and stuff. Mm-hmm. But I very very much enjoyed watching that program. It was a diff- It's a different uh, kind of viewing experience. Where you're just like I like these colors, <laughs> but I really like it because uh, you well you're basically scrunching up your brain all day at work. And yeah, it's like a good but there was something to... about those characters that you you did you cared about them. You did care about those characters. And now they're doing Sex in the City babies, basically, yes, they're like the Muppet Baby here. version, right here down the hall. What? Mm-hmm. Are you getting some uh, inside scoop? No, but I see a lot of racks of '80s clothes going by. <laughs> That's like a good idea. It's a cute idea. Yeah. What else? Do, what are, are there any other shows that you like that you that you're watching right now? Or do you even have time? Well, I watched Mad Men, and of course, I'm already behind, but. Uh, the ones I've seen have been great. Um, no, there's a lot of shows that I know are great that people tell me are great that I haven't been like I haven't seen Downton Abbey yet. I've still never seen Breaking Bad. It's reprehensible. Um, both of these shows are supposed to be fantastic. They are, but I'm very forgiving of people who are busy because 
when people go, have you seen this? And I go, no. And they're like, what? How do you do? And you're like, because I yeah. work. <laughs> yeah, I work. People come to me like, I haven't seen your show. I'm like, that's fine. You don't even have to, don't even have to tell me. It's fine. Hey, listen, uh, I don't watch television. My friend says you're on TV over there. So I thought I would just come up and talk in your face. I think it's actually... I think it's actually in this week's coming episode that these guys gave Tracy Morgan a line. I see something about, you know, these reality shows, because it's, um, we'll see, it's place in, anyway. Yeah. This week's episode. But uh, Tracy, Jordan has the line of, I don't really watch TV. I'm more of a masturbator. It's <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> kind of a good take on that <laughs> attitude. <laughs> And character appropriate for him. Uh, finally, I'll ask you before I uh, release you back into the wilds of your office. Um, so, or, I, I keep getting confused. Are, are you on Twitter or are you not on I Twitter? I am not on Twitter. You're not on Twitter. I all the Tina Fey's are fake. They're all fake. Okay. Um, they're all me- older men. I don't know. I don't know who they are. <laughs> no, they're all fake. You're not, you're not talking to me. Do you not, is, is, do you not want to be that street level with stuff or is it just no time time. I think it would be such a rabbit hole because I do like to sometimes go on if you if you want to know what that sound is I'm eating a very tiny orange that is the the most diminutive adorable it's a clementine right that is that is adorable Mm -hmm. tiny (laughs) uh uh yeah I, I I just think it I like to go on I've sort of figured out how to go on Twitter without signing up for it and just kind of there's certain people's feed that I like to look at but but um, no I don't I don't have some time to do that is it a head trip at all are you able to sort of deal with the fact that you are a pretty substantial role model <laughs> I mean like, uh, I mean you really are uh, you know and and I think it's important when there's so much like Kardashian role modeling in the world like I, I root for you extra hard because I feel like you're I think you're important to. That's very nice of you. I think you're important. I think you're an important role model for people, certainly for for young women mm-hmm. to have, and, and and more aspirational than I just want to be famous for no fucking reason. Well, that is a dangerous thing. Wanting to be famous for no reason is a pervasive uh, thing. Um, but I will say that the, some of those other reality star girls, the Kardashians, I'll tell you one thing they have. Well, there's many things you could say that they have that I don't have, but um, one thing they have is they have some serious business sense so if, the, if you were a 14 year old girl now and you could try to if you could try to look at them and solely learn about business and marketing sure but not film yourself doing uh, stuff with Ray J specifically sure. just partic- particularly just Ray J no not Ray J <laughs> Any, anyone else <laughs> anyone else is fine um, yeah but I, yeah I, don't, I mean I guess there's certainly worse things yeah I, I guess if if you had a kid, uh, at least, you know, I go, well, I don't smoke and I don't drink. And I went all through school. So as a mom, I'd be like, okay, that's, I'm not the, I'm not the worst uh, role model, I guess. Do you have any of that marketing sense or do you just no, not give I a could, shit about any I'm of it? So, I mean, I, for me to say, I you know about money. Like I know how to like, don't spend too much money and make sure you, you know, pay off your credit card. But in terms of that thing where people can take money and turn it into more money, I don't got it. I don't have it. What do you envision? If, you know, if in a, whenever you decide, you know, not to do 30 Rock anymore, mm-hmm. do you want to take a break or do you want to write movies or do you want to do more I definitely, w- I definitely want to write another movie because I, I haven't, I haven't written a, a, a movie since Mean Girls and I, it, I want to do it again. I feel like I could do a better job. Um, I think I've learned more about story mostly. Um, I for sure want to do that again. Uh, and I would definitely, I would want to take a, a short respite from TV if I could just because it's a very um, exhausting process or at least single camera is I mean I would love it if multi-camera just came back into fashion yeah because there's no shame in it you can I mean look at Cheers like you can do a multi-camera show that is excellent they don't have to be dumb if the network will let you sure (laughs) Um, but there's you know if there's some way to do that multi-camera lifestyle it's just it's just a much better uh Lifestyle. It might come back. It. it could. It could come back. They certainly want it to come back because it's so much less expensive to do. I, do you ever have that weird fear of like maybe every joke's just been done at this point and there just aren't any left in this particular format? Uh, 
Yeah, and I, well, I, sometimes we have that with our show where someone will pitch something that the first thing will go like, we can't do that, that's insane. And then the next breath we go like, also we did it. <laughs> like or something just, I can't think of an example, but there have been several times where it's like a, a pitch that should be too extreme and we've done it already. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, it's, it's interesting. If, I think if you are kind of operating from a place of specificity, uh, whether your you know your characters are specific to you, you knew them somewhere, they existed somewhere in the universe, and you try to tell truthful stories about those characters. I think it'll, you'll be able to find stuff. Yeah. But it's I guess when you get into just generalities that you're like, they she works at magazine office. Sure. And she's quirky in this way, and yeah. she has this snappy thing to say. Mm-hmm. I think it's probably exciting when you're. I mean, if you're, you know when you get a bunch of experience now you have six years experience at 30 rock and you have you know me girls and, so on, and now you get to on the next thing you i think it's kind of exciting to be like oh i can't wait to apply all this shit that i've learned and then make that thing to try to make a new thing yeah i think it will be exciting i think um uh and i i've been out of a full-time writer's room so long now that i look forward to to and that's what it was like another sigh of relief that I breathed about when the book came out and it was okay. I was like, okay, I did read the book by myself, so I, I can still write things. Um, so yeah, I, I look forward to to doing that. I mean, I, I feel so much affection for these characters and I feel like we've spent so much time with them and um, that it will be it will be weird when we murder them all in the final episode. <laughs> oh my God, that's the hugest spoiler ever. When they get centipeded in that final episode. <laughs> You don't think you're going to cry, but you're going to cry. I never thought a centipede could make me cry. When Tracy calls middle on the centipede <laughs> without really understanding how bad that is. <laughs> do you need other people? To, do you, do you, you prefer to write in a room with other people? That way? I, I do for... I mean, I, listen, I have the best, best job in television because what I have is a room full of people who are working hard and pitching a great ideas, and I get to come in and pitch when I can, and then I get to pick... I get to pick which ones we go with, which is just obscene. You know, I get to say, like, what are your 50, 50 uh, excellent pitches? Great. I say this one. I mean, that's, it's just obscene how lucky that is to be able to shop from uh, all these intelligent people's brains. It's hard to do, too, because it takes a while to get the confidence to go, yes, I picked that and I stand behind that. Yes, although I, I do feel like after doing the running the table, the rewrite tables at, at SNL for a few years, um, with this, I feel like, well, this, uh, on, if I ever question, I go like, well, you know, my job, at the end of the day, my job, what I've been hired to do is to make the show that they hired me to make the show that I would make. So that helps me just feel like, well, I'm going to pick the joke that, that I like. Yeah. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but I'll feel better about it than if I give it. We actually had a thing with the live show where um, the one bit that as we were did the table read and we were rewriting it and um, people were like, everyone was pitching that we change it was this beat that whole, this runner of three beats that we did with John Hamm and Tracy that were kind of an Amos and Andy mm-hmm. thing and John wasn't here for the table read and it was so like it didn't really play at the table and then I kept going to shoot and I come back and they're like so we have like a new pitch for that and I'd be like let's put it back guys and they'd be like so we gotta go boy shoot some more and they come back and they were and they'd be like so we think maybe we'll just do one beat of it and I was like I think let's keep it let's keep it th-. and it's just that was one where I was definitely ready to take the bullet if that right. if people got super mad about that um, I think I think it all worked out okay but that was one place where I was like well if we're if we're gonna if we're gonna go down I'll just choose my own poison here when you're writing your when you're writing the movie, movie script is it do you write like a is, is there an outline or do you start like do you write it like a book and then figure out how the, the dialogue well here we outline um, the room breaks the stories, and then we write really pretty detailed outlines, and then work off of those. Um, when I wrote Mean Girls, I I tried. I thought I had kind of broken a story, but I realize now that I needed way more story. And I was getting the notes from Paramount at the time, like we, we like this, we like this, but it needs more story. And I was like, I don't even know what the, what does that mean. Um, it just meant that I didn't read it this weekend because I went on a holiday with my kids. <laughs> uh, I just had to give you a note. No, they were right. It needed more story. Um, but so now, yeah. If I were, you know, when, when next I attempt to write a movie, I think I will. I will try to use the. I think everyone aspires to the Pixar model of just just board that story out as if it costs a million dollars a frame, mm-hmm. and because you're always going to be able to come up with 
jokes and textures, of, but it's that story that, that will kill you if you don't have it. And then some of the jokes come to life when you're actually shooting it, too, if you hire funny people. Yes. Yes. Although we usually, we don't, we don't pitch that much on the floor here, anyway. It's usually pretty laid out. Well, this, is a, this was amazing. Uh, I can't, thank you for giving me more time than you probably had in your day. It's my pleasure. Now I have to go, I'm going down to the edit room, and we're going to cut, like, Five minutes out of our season finale. Ugh. It's going to be painful. So this is a delight. Well, people, I don't think people really. If people don't work in television, they don't know that five minutes is a really. It's a lot. This came in way too long. Yeah, even finding three minutes, two minutes, is because our half hours only. It's twenty-one minutes and fifteen seconds, I believe. Ugh. We're just like, oh, maybe if you could just cut to the bus a little bit faster. Right. Oh, that only saved us a second. Yeah. Oh, fuck. Yep. yep. <laughs> it's a lot of that. <laughs> But awesome. Well, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you for coming out here to Long Island City. Of course. It's a lovely Long Island City. Um, and uh, not to freak you out, but I love you really hard. Oh, that's so nice. I should have worn the street makeup. Just no, a courtesy. You look, I, I, a courtesy. I think you look amazing. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you. Thank you so much, Tina Fey. Thank you. Enjoy your burrito, everyone. Right on. Thanks for now leaving Nerdist.com. Enjoy your burrito. <laughs> This episode of the Nerdist Podcast was brought to you by Universal Pictures Battleship. The battle for Earth begins at sea Friday, May 18th.